Walk into any modern museum or open any history textbook and the picture of the past presented is one in which humanity started from primitive beginnings and steadily progressed upward in the development of culture and science. Most of the artifacts preserved in archaeological and geological records have been neatly arranged to fit this accepted linear view of our past. Yet many other tantalizing bits and pieces unearthed offer a very different story of what really happened. Called out-of-place artifacts, they don't fit the established pattern of prehistory, pointing back instead to the existence of advanced civilizations before any of the known ancient cultures came into being. Though such discoveries with their inherent sophistication are well documented, most historians would like to sweep these anomalies under the proverbial rug. But the rug of true history is getting very lumpy and hard to step across without tripping over such obvious contradictions to the conservative picture of antiquity. What's more, the mysterious artifacts confirm ancient legends and stories which describe human history not as linear but cyclic. Forgotten ages and former worlds rose and fell in great cycles of life and death over millions of years. Lost to our memory except in myths and now through a few amazing pieces left to us. Jordan Cody's on the 22nd of March 2011 David Elkington issued a press release stating that a horde of ancient books made of lead and copper together with other artifacts probably dating from the first century AD had been found in Jordan and that they might predate the writings of st. Paul and that leading academics believe they might be as important as the Dead Sea Scrolls Elkington also stated that the items were discovered five years previously in a cave by Jordanian Bedouin and smuggled into Israel where they were at risk of sale on the black market or of destruction Elkington stated that the find consisted of up to 70 ring bound books made of lead and copper many of them are sealed on all sides scrolls tablets and other artifacts including an incense bowl were also found at the same site some of the lead pages are written in a form of archaic Hebrew script with ancient messianic symbols some of the writing appears to be in the form of code metallurgical analysis on the books and carbon dating on a piece of leather found with the collection suggest that the books could be about 2,000 years old Elkington described as a scholar of ancient religious archaeology claimed that they could be the major discovery of Christian history another source stated the books consisted of between 5 to 15 leaves or plates each about the size of a credit card made of lead and copper and bound together with lead rings on one side many of the books are also sealed with rings on the remaining three sides Elkington reported that in the upper square we have the seven branch menorah and the text is said to be an archaic Hebrew script and some in code the presence of a cross tomb and city of Jerusalem is being said to be depicted in the books if the artifacts are genuine they could be Christian texts from as early as 33 AD a report stated that a line has been translated from the text as I shall walk uprightly Ashkola pillar a testimony to ancient metallurgical skills in Delhi India is called the Ashkola pillar standing over 23 feet it averages 16 inches in diameter and weighs about six tons the solid wrought iron shaft is made up of expertly welded discs an inscription on the base is an epitaph to King Chandra Gupta the second who died in AD 413 despite being well over a millennium and a half in age the pillars constitution is remarkably preserved the smooth surface is like polished brass with only occasional instances of pockmarks and weathering the mystery is that any equivalent mass of iron subjected to the Indian monsoon rains winds and temperatures for 1600 years or more would have been reduced to rust long ago production of the iron and the techniques of preservation are far beyond fifth century abilities it's probably far older maybe several thousand years who were the mysterious metallurgists who made this wonder and what happened to their civilization a few days before Easter Sunday in 1900 Greek sponge divers off the small island of Antikythera discovered the remains of an ancient ship 
filled with bronze and marble statues and assorted artifacts later dated between 85 and 50 BC. Among the finds was a small formless lump of corroded bronze and rotted wood, which was sent along with the other artifacts to the National Museum in Athens for further study. Soon as the wood fragments dried and shrank from exposure to the air, the lump split open revealing inside the outlines of a series of gear wheels like a modern clock. In 1958, Dr. Jarek de Sola Price successfully reconstructed the machine's appearance and use. The gearing system calculated the annual movements of the sun and moon. The arrangement shows that the gears would be moved forward and backward with ease at any speed. The device was not a clock but more like a calculator that could show the position of the heavens past, present and future. It's highly possible that the device may have origins ages long before the Greeks and in a land far removed, now unknown. Occasionally the world comes across events, discoveries and architectural pieces that generate a lot of controversies, debates and arguments. Rama's Bridge the Rama Sethu, also known as Adam's Bridge, is very much real. There's no debate regarding that. But what has caused controversies is the multitude of tales surrounding its origin. What makes this structure interesting is the fact that it's described in ancient Hindu scriptures. In the epic, it's mentioned how Ramayana built a bridge 1,700,000 years ago between India and the coast of Sri Lanka. Rama, whose wife had been kidnapped, organized an army consisting of monkeys and built a bridge that led them to Sri Lanka, where a lengthy war broke out. A carved stone relief at Prambanan Temple on the island of Java in Indonesia shows monkeys helping Rama by bringing stones for building the bridge. In a strange turn of events, a US-based news channel, along with Vaishnava News Network, said that they found a remnant of the bridge constructed by Lord Hanuman and the Vanara army and that they had evidence collecting from a NASA satellite to prove their claims. Then Dr. Badrinya Aranyan, the former director of the Geological Survey of India, performed a survey of the structure and concluded that it was man-made. Dr. Badrinya Aranyan and his team drilled 10 boreholes along the alignment of Adams Bridge. What he discovered was startling. About 6 meters below the surface, he found a consistent layer of calcareous sandstone corals and boulder-like materials. His team was surprised when they discovered a layer of loose sand some four to five meters further down and then hard rock formations below that. A team of divers examined the bridge. The boulders they observed were not composed of a typical marine formation. They were identified as having come from either side of the causeway. There is evidence of ancient quarrying in these sites. His team concluded that materials from either shore were placed upon the sandy bottom of the water to form the causeway. Saqqara Bird In 1898, a curious winged object was discovered in the tomb of Paddin Imen in north of Saqqara, Egypt, dated to about 200 BC. Because the birth of modern aviation was still several years away, when the strange artifact was sent to the Cairo Museum, it was catalogued and then shelved among other miscellaneous items to gather dust. Seventy years later, Dr. Khalil Masiha, an Egyptologist and archaeologist, was examining a museum display labeled bird figurines. While most of the displays were indeed bird sculptures, the Saqqara artifact was certainly not. It possessed characteristics never found on birds, yet which are part of modern aircraft design. Dr. Messia, a former model plane enthusiast, immediately recognized the aircraft features and persuaded the Egyptian Ministry of Culture to investigate. Made of very light sycamore, the craft weighs half an ounce, with straight and aerodynamically shaped wings spanning about seven inches. A separate slotted piece fits into the tail precisely like the back tail wing on a modern plane. A full-scale version could have flown carrying heavy loads but at low speeds between 45 and 65 miles per hour. What is not known, however, is what the power source was. The model makes a perfect glider as it is. Even though over 2,000 years old, 
it will soar a considerable distance with only a slight jerk of the hand fully restored balsa replicas travel even farther Messiah notes that the ancient Egyptians often built scale models of everything familiar in their daily lives and placed them in their tombs temples ships chariots servants animals and so forth now that we found a model plane Messia wonders if perhaps somewhere under the desert sands there may be on earth the remains of life-size gliders Sumerian planet a sphere a cuneiform clay tablet which for over 150 years defied attempts at interpretation has now been revealed to describe an asteroid impact which in 3123 BC hit Kofels, Austria, leaving in its wake a tale of destruction which may account for the biblical tale of Sodom and Gomorrah. The planisphere clay tablet inscribed around 700 BC was unearthed by Henry Laird in the remains of the library of the Assyrian royal palace at Nineveh, close to modern-day Mosul, Iraq. It's a copy of the night diary of a Sumerian astronomer containing drawings of constellations and known constellation names but it required modern computer tech to finally unravel its exact meaning. Alan Bond subjected the planisphere to a program which can simulate trajectories and reconstruct the night sky thousands of years ago. They discovered that it described events in the sky before dawn on the 29th of June, 3123 BC, with half of it noting planet positions and cloud cover the same as any other night. The other half, however, records an object large enough for its shape to be noted even though it's still in space and tracks its trajectory relative to the stars that a large body had impacted at Kofels had been long suspected the evidence being a great landslide 500 meters thick and 5 kilometers in diameter the site had no impact crater to back the theory but the researchers now believe they have a plausible explanation for that the observation suggests the asteroid is over a kilometer in diameter and the original orbit around the Sun was an Aten type a class of asteroid that orbit close to the earth that is resonant with the earth's orbit this trajectory explains why there's no crater at Kofels the incoming angle was very low six degrees and means the asteroid clipped a mountain called Gamskogel above the town of Langenfeld 11 kilometers from Kofels and this caused the asteroid to explode before it reached its final impact point as it traveled down the valley it became a fireball around five kilometers in diameter the size of the landslide when it hit Kofels it created enormous pressures that pulverized the rock and caused the landslide but because it was no longer a solid object it did not create a classic impact crater another conclusion can be made from the trajectory the back plume from the explosion would be bent over the Mediterranean Sea re-entering the atmosphere over the Levant Sinai and northern Egypt South American jet in 1954 the government of Colombia sent part of its collection of ancient gold artifacts on a US tour Emanuel Staubs one of America's leading jewelers was commissioned to cast reproductions of six of the objects 15 years later one was given to biologist zoologist Ivan T Sanderson for analysis after a thorough examination and consulting several experts Sanderson's mind-boggling conclusion was that the object is a model of a high-speed aircraft at least a thousand years old approximately two inches long the object was worn as a pendant on a neck chain it was classified as Sanu a pre-Incan culture from AD 500 to 800 both Sanderson and Dr. Arthur Poisley of the Aeronautical Institute of New York concluded it did not represent any known winged animal. In fact, the little artifact appears more mechanical than biological. For example, the front wings are delta shaped and rigidly straight edged, very unanimal like. The rudder is perhaps the most unanimal but airplane like item. It's a right triangle, flat surfaced and rigidly perpendicular to the wings. Only fish have upright tail fins, but none have exclusively an upright flange without a counterbalancing lower one. 
adding to the mystery an insignia appears on the left face of the rudder precisely where ID marks appear on many airplanes today the insignia is perhaps as out of place as the gold model itself for it's been identified as the Aramaic or early Hebrew letter Beth or B this may indicate that the original plane did not come from Columbia but was the product of a very early people inhabiting the Middle East who knew the secret of flying Dendera Zodiac The Dendera Zodiac is an ancient bas-relief temple ceiling carved with mysterious symbols of stars and planets during Napoleon's Egyptian campaign 1798 to 1801 French scientists discovered the zodiac in the ceiling of a small chapel on top of a temple outside the town of Dendera near Thebes made of sandstone and weighing many tons the zodiac excited immense wonder and admiration because it seemed to open a window onto a civilization of extreme antiquity heated arguments developed between those who believed the ceiling was a picture of the sky at the time of the temple's construction and others keen to find significance in these zodiac symbols soon scientists began to claim that the zodiac might have been carved many thousands of years before the biblical date for the creation of the world the drawing was certainly intriguing Jean LaLaurian engineer and archaeological bounty hunter traveled up the Nile from Alexandria with orders to remove the zodiac as part of a carefully planned archaeological heist the ceiling arrived back in France amidst a flurry of publicity that while orchestrated by Sebastian Saulnier it was further heightened by the French mania for all things Egyptian as arguments about the zodiacs antiquity increased in number and ferocity a third line of Egyptological discussion was developing one that focused on the inscriptions found on the Rosetta Stone at the time the hieroglyphic code had not yet been broken although both the English polymath physician and foreign secretary of the Royal Society Thomas Young and the young French firebrand Champollion were getting close each fighting the other in the race to finish without a way to read hieroglyphics everyone whether savant or mystic was free to interpret the arcane symbols including those found on the Dendera ceiling in whatever way they wished Joseph Fourier estimated the age was 2500 BC Champollion among others believed it was a religious zodiac Champollion placed the zodiac in 4th century AD George Cuvier placed the date 123 AD to 147 AD the Pope favored Champollion he was so grateful for saving traditional biblical chronology that he offered to make the Republican non-religious and very merry Champollion a cardinal this piece is still controversial today and believe it or not is used by some as proof of the mystery of planet X James Ossuary in 2012 the biblical archaeological society and the Discovery Channel announced in Washington DC that an ancient inscription on a 2,000 year old ossuary with the inscribed Aramaic words James son of Joseph brother of Jesus was genuine however controversy and a lawsuit over the veracity of the inscription followed some called it the most important New Testament archaeological discover ever this artifact verifies exact biblical relation between Jesus his brother James and their earthly father Joseph the box is inscribed in Aramaic on one side the English translation reads James son of Joseph brother of Jesus the inscription is considered significant because it provides archaeological evidence for Jesus of Nazareth almost beyond doubt for that reason this ossuary is extremely controversial but having been through a lengthy forgery trial in Israel it's now been found to be real and its owner Oded Golan totally vindicated the prosecution despite hiring the best experts in the world could not prove their case according to Andre Lemaire a highly respected Parisian epigrapher the cursive Aramaic script is consistent with first century lettering he determined that the inscription was not incised with modern tools as it contains no elements not available in the ancient world the results of a detailed statistical analysis of the likelihood that James Ossuary refers to Jesus of Nazareth 
considering the possible number of those who were named Jesus, Joseph, and James at that time, and then adding other statistical estimates such as the total adult male population. The number of individuals in that population who bear the three names with this relation is one or two. Of course, the Bible is clear that there certainly was one named James whose father was named Joseph and whose brother Jesus was worthy of the honor shown by inscribing his name on an ossuary. With as much surety as modern analysis can muster, this artifact and its inscription are genuine. This ossuary verifies exact details in the Bible, which makes it one of the most controversial artifacts ever discovered. Trilobed Disc of Sabu On the first floor of the Cairo Museum, there's a strange item, a round plate with three inflection discovered in the tomb of Sabu, Pharaoh Anijib's son. This mysterious item classified as an out-of-place artifact. In this case, the plate is dated for the years 3000 to 3100 BC, but researchers just cannot seem to reconcile this with its sophisticated design. It's made from metasiltstone, a material used in ancient Egypt for carving delicate objects without breaking them. Many objects made of this material were found by archaeologists, but the round plate of Sabu is the strangest of all. It's incredibly thin, even related to the fine material. Designed with hollow hole in the center of the plate, it resembles a three-blade propeller and suggests that it placed on an axis. Plate itself is not perfectly symmetrical but three very similar bindings tilted at an angle of 120 degrees accurate from the disc. What's the purpose of this object? The only thing most researchers agree on is that it was not used as a wheel because the wheel appeared relatively late in Egypt compared to the item's age. Another scenario is the placard was proposed as a kind of hydraulic propeller. If so, Egyptians were able to develop a technology that made electric motors available for them. Some suggested that the placard was part of a generator or a battery to generate electricity. There are many alternative explanations for the almost unfathomable idea that the Egyptians were able to use electricity, but they all raise questions. It seems that the real mystery is not what the object was used for, but who were those who had the skills required to format it. Even today, to manufacture such a thin forms, so proportional, from a very hard rock is hard enough and apparently required to use sophisticated machine technology and computerized three-dimensional. Is a skilled stone carver could achieve the same result alone ancient Egypt of 5,000 years ago? Ica Stones A unique time capsule of images is housed in a warehouse in Ica, Peru. Here are some 20,000 stone boulders tablets and baseball sized rocks decorated with an astounding assortment of pictures in many cases very much out of time and place the owner is local physician amateur archaeologist and geologist dr. Javier Cabrera Darquea most material employed is a gray andesite an extremely hard granitic semi crystalline matrix that's very difficult to carve but as dr. Cabrera observed People have been finding these engraved stones in the region for years. They were first seen and recorded by Jesuit missionary Father Simon, who accompanied Pizarro in 1525. Samples were shipped to Spain in 1562. The stone portraits show very sophisticated surgery skills and medical knowledge, in some cases as advanced or even more advanced than today. There are scenes of blood transfusions, the use of acupuncture needles as an aesthetic which only gained use in the West since the late 1970s, delicate operations as well as 20 stones showing a step-by-step -step heart transplant procedure. This is a revelation in itself, that someone in unknown antiquity achieved a level of sophistication rivaling our own, but there are other pictures even more out of place. As Dr. Cabrera noted, and as has been verified by other medical physicians, there are stone etchings which show a brain transplant. The prehistoric surgeons, it's evident, possessed knowledge several steps beyond modern-day surgery.
Baghdad Battery A 2,200-year-old clay jar found near Baghdad, Iraq has been described as the oldest known electric battery in existence. The clay jar and others like it are part of the holdings of the National Museum of Iraq and have been attributed to the Parthian Empire, an ancient Asian culture that ruled most of the Middle East from 247 BC to AD 228. The jar itself has been dated to sometime around 200 BC. It was first described in 1938 by German archaeologist Wilhelm Koenig. So how is it that a 2,200-year-old clay jar can be called a battery? Those who have examined it closely say that there's little else that can be. The nondescript earthen jar is only 5.5 inches high by 3 inches across. The opening was sealed with an asphalt plug which held in place a copper sheet, rolled into a tube. This tube was capped at the bottom with a copper disc held in place by more asphalt. A narrow iron rod was struck through the upper asphalt plug and hung down into the center of the copper tube, not touching any part of it. Fill the jar with an acidic liquid, such as vinegar or fermented grape juice, and you have yourself a battery capable of generating a small current. The acidic liquid permits a flow of electrons from the copper tube to the iron rod when the two metal terminals are connected. This is basically the same principle that was discovered by Galvani 2,000 years later and that Volta successfully harnessed into the first modern battery a few years later. Experiments with models of the Baghdad battery have generated between 1.5 and 2 volts, not a lot of power. So what would batteries have been used for 2,000 years ago? Perhaps the battery was used as a ready source of analgesic electricity. Other theories hold that several batteries could have been linked together to generate a higher voltage for the use in electroplating gold to a silver surface. More experiments with several Baghdad-type batteries have shown this to be possible. South African Spheres For the past three decades, miners at Wonderstone Silver Mine near Adestal in the western Transvaal, South Africa, have been extracting out of deep rock several strange metallic spheroids. So far, at least 200 have been found. In 1979, several were closely examined by J. R. McIver, professor of geology at the University of Witwatersand in Johannesburg, and geologist Professor Andres Bischoff of Potchefstroom University. The metallic spheroids look like flattened globes, averaging 1 to 4 inches in diameter, and their exteriors are usually colored steel blue with a reddish reflection, and embedded in the metal are tiny flecks of white fibers. They are made of a nickel steel alloy which does not occur naturally, and is a composition that rules them out, being of meteoric origin. Some have only a thin shell about a quarter of an inch thick, and when broken open are found filled with a strange spongy material that disintegrated into dust on contact with the air. What makes all this very remarkable is that these spheroids were mined out of a layer of pyrophyllite rock, dated both geologically and by the various radioisotope dating techniques as being at least 2.8 to 3 billion years old. Adding mystery to mystery, Rolf Marx, curator of the South African Klerkstorp Museum, has discovered that the spheroid he has on exhibit slowly rotates on its axis by its own power, well locked in its display case and free of outside vibrations. There may thus be an energy extant within these spheroids still operating after three eons of time. Ubaid Lizardmen The name Ubaid is derived from an archaeological site where a large amount of material for the period was excavated, Tel al Ubaid. Among the artifacts on Earth were what has come to be known as the Ubaid Lizardmen. These are humanoid figures with reptilian characteristics. The actual definitive genesis of the Ubaid civilization is a mystery. They are known to have lived in villages scattered about the region. They were acquainted with basic architecture, they paved their streets and built admirable structures, 
considering the time in which they existed. They were also accomplished in the agricultural sciences. They were perhaps the first to use a relatively advanced irrigation system. Some of the larger buildings and temples they created became focal points of the later Sumerian civilization. The Al Ubaid site was first excavated in 1919 by Harry Reginald Hale, whose team discovered both male and female lizardmen figurines in varying postures. Nearly all the figurines appear to be wearing helmets and shoulder padding. Some of the figures are holding scepters. Female figures are depicted holding infants that appear to be suckling milk. Suckling is a mammalian trait. Reptiles do not suckle or produce milk. Both the parent and child figurines are reptilian, lizard-like. Ancient alien theorists have speculated that perhaps these lizardmen figurines depict an ancient race of star people who came to Earth in the Ubaidian era. Naysayers point out that the Ubaid civilization practiced skull modification, whereby the skull was manipulated from infancy to deform to an oblong shape. This would explain the head shapes. The almond-shaped oval eyes are a common primitive stylistic rendering of Asiatic features, and less pronounced examples have earlier been found around the region. But why the two features were merged together on one genre of sculpture is a mystery in and of itself. The Ubaid themselves were not Asiatic. Had they been, there would have been a more realistic depiction of the eyes, which is evidenced by ancient Oriental art. Artifacts of lizard-like creatures have been found in the Middle East and many other ancient civilizations spanning the globe. Carved Stone Balls of Scotland the carved stone balls are mysterious objects and they've been the subject of much speculation by scientists over the years. Over 400 of these unique objects have been found, nearly all of them in Scotland, with the majority found in Aberdeenshire. However, some samples were also discovered in Britain and Ireland. The stone balls date from around 3500 to 1500 BC, a period spanning between the later Neolithic area and the Bronze Age almost all come from Scotland a few have been found in northern England and Ireland all the stones are made of various materials ranging from sandstone to granite and they're all decorated with knobs around the surface the number of knobs range from between 3 to 160 but the most common ones are those with six projecting knobs some carved balls have additional decoration such as the spaces between the knobs which are decorated with hatchings incised lines spirals and concentric circles most of the stones are of a comparable size with a diameter of three inches although some larger ones were found ranging from three and a half to four and a half inches over 400 examples of these balls are known the symmetrical patterns engraved all over the surface on some of the objects suggest that the neolithic people were experimenting with solid geometry a type of geometrical form known as platonic solid the ancient Greek philosopher and mathematician Plato was the first to mention these solids as the core patterns of physical creation. Intriguingly, the Scottish stones are dated a millennium before Plato's time, which is what makes them so fascinating for mathematicians. They believe that there's a possibility that these stones are the earliest examples of experiments in solid geometry anywhere in the world. Possible relationship to the platonic solids of the Greek mathematicians. Historians have puzzled over the use and meaning of these stones and while many theories have been offered none have been firmly accepted Theories range from spiritual meanings tools tribal council meeting speaker stones a form of currency Weapons, etc. As of today these stones remain a complete mystery We hope this documentary entertained you if it did please leave a like and don't forget to hit the bell to get notified of future documentaries.